Hi, I'm Heather French Henry, the host of Heart of Gold, a monthly program whose mission is to highlight examples of what makes Louisville, Kentucky the most compassionate city in the world, as declared by Mayor Greg Fisher. This series features local nonprofit organizations of all shapes and sizes, which are working to improve the quality of life for all Louisville citizens. Thank you for joining us today, and a special thanks to WHAS TV for generously producing this series. This segment features senior care experts. Senior care experts' mission is to enable seniors to live healthy, comfortable, and fulfilling lives at home by being a trusted nonprofit provider of services, products, and information in Metro Louisville. They help older adults maintain their self-respect and dignity by helping them remain independent. I'm happy to be here with senior care expert executive director Patty Desell. Hi, Patty. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I tell you, you have such a wonderful job, and I'm sure it's not a job to you. It so is not a job. Tell me a little bit about uh, senior care and what your mission is, and why you feel it's so important. Well, by helping people live independently, people want to stay at home, or they want to choose where they want to age, and we believe that everybody has that right to choose. These are our oldest citizens, and some of these folks have lived in their homes for 50 years, and that's where they want to stay. So we actually create, or not create, we have programs and services that allow them to stay at home safely, and then that allows them to, to keep that self-respect and their dignity. How important it is, is it to your residents or to the people that you serve um, for them to stay at home? Is that one of the number one wishes when they seek out senior care is how long can I keep mom and dad home or how long can I stay at home before I have to go into a facility? Both. Okay. Um, there are, the parents are usually the ones saying, I want to stay home. I do not want to go to facility. Now, not everybody can stay at home forever. There is a time that, you know, and we'll be the first ones to say, even though it is our mission that they stay at home, but we'll be the first ones to say it's not safe anymore. To recognize that. And it's time mm -hmm. for you to have more social interaction. It's time for you to be someplace where uh, it's going to be better for you in the long run. Um, we have a lot of the adult children that will call us and say, Mom wants to stay at home, and we want to, you know, her wishes are to stay at home, and that's what we want to do. We help a lot of seniors that their adult children are out of state. And so they can't help mom when they're that far or dad or mom and dad together. So it's really important just to be able to recognize what they want to do and what their wishes are. And so if we can help them stay home, even if it's just a little bit longer, that's what we're doing. And I'm sure there's so many individual needs as well. Tell me about some of the programs that you all offer. Our programs are we very much to the individual. We don't, we're not a cookie cutter organization by any means. We have a home delivered meals program. Um, our home delivered meals are prepared by chefs. They are heart healthy, low sodium. We are the really the only alternative to the Metro Meals on Wheels program. The Metro Meals on Wheels, great program. Um, but they have federal funding, and so some of their funding has been cut, and they have a waiting list because there's certain requirements for folks. We, the requirement is, is can you pay $7 for a meal? Um, if we have grants and donations, we can usually help if there's financial hardship. These are like fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, biscuit, and butter, and dessert. I mean, these are major meals. Sounds like I need to sign up. Oh. <laughs> And I mean, they're really nice, and they have a menu, they have a choice. And so there's a volunteer that's actually taking the, taking the meal to them. This is great for the food and the, and the nutrition, because we have found that a lot of people that are living on their own, they're eating peanut butter and crackers or a can of soup. They're not getting the right nutrition. So the food is good, but the volunteer that is knocking on the door is checking on them every day. So they're opening up the door, and our volunteers are trained to kind of, is there a change in appearance? Is there a change in behavior? You know, is everything okay? Have they answered the door? Um, our volunteers have called us and said, you know, Mrs. Smith is not answering the door. And so we'll start calling, we'll call the next door neighbor, we'll call the daughter in Utah and say, hey, what's going on? Oh, forgot to tell you, mom's at a doctor's appointment. But that's okay, we're still checking on them. Other times, there have been life and death situations. And if that volunteer had not been knocking on that door that day, just to check on them, we may not have known. Well, let's talk about the volunteers and the population you serve. Um, how many volunteers do you have, and what is the size of the population that you serve? We average, as far as our clients, we average about 1,500 clients a month, 
and we have um, about 225 to almost 250 volunteers. And there's only five staff. I mean, we're very small. So our volunteers are really the key. I mean, they are the heart of the organization. How do you find volunteers? Can people uh, call up or you have to have specific skills? Anywhere skill we can find them. Okay. okay. <laughs> we love uh, volunteers from, we have organizations like UPS and First Capital Bank that they have a pool of people that drive the meals for us. So one person may only drive once a month, but there's a pool of people that are doing that. We have the same thing at different churches. We have folks that are retired that they want to drive. We have school teachers that actually use, they're driving with their special ed children. We have Harbor House, which is for, um, you know, disabled adults or, or mentally challenged adults. And they drive some of our meals, the Down Syndrome. So we, we love having a variety of volunteers, and the volunteers really get a lot out of it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your food drives. The food drives we have um, typically three times a year. Um, we do have people that cannot afford seven dollars a meal. Um, with even all of our services, when volunteers go in the door, I mean, they let us know if somebody, they're in dire straits. I mean, they're opening up the pantry and the refrigerator and there's no food. So we actually keep kind of a running list and we collect non-perishable foods. We collect toiletries and paper towels and toilet paper and blankets and dog food and cat food. Because for an older adult, having an animal is not a luxury, it's a companion. So we have found that people are feeding their food to their animals. So we will collect cat food and dog food as well as all this food and then we're, we're taking food to these people three times a year. We partner with Dare to Care, so we're not in competition by any means. Um, but we have some folks that they're not able to go to Dare to Care because they're homebound. So Dare to Care has actually supplied us with some additional food and we've taken it. We're not a pantry, but we help people at least three times a year with, with some serious amount of food. Wow. Yeah, which really helps. And then we have, you know, cash donations that will go and buy the milk sure. and the eggs and cheese and, you know, that sort of thing. Tell so. me real quick about Westport Seniors. Westport Seniors is really fun. It's once a month. We do it at the church. It's the Westport Road Christian Church right there by the ramp of the Waterson Expressway. We welcome everyone. Um, and it is $5 for lunch. We have sponsors that come in and, you know, talk to us. And we might play bingo. We might have... Um, musical entertainment we might have somebody singing i mean we just have a really good time and it really provides nice socialization for folks and um all we ask is that anybody that comes that they're able to feed themselves and um and they're welcome everybody can come we love it and so in order to get involved or to find out more about the program i'm sure on your website you yes. have all of this listed and it's www dot sr is in senior yes. uh, srcareexperts.org yes. and you're willing to take volunteers absolutely donations cash donations and also how people can find out how to get their loved ones involved in the program correct yes and we have the meals we have transportation we have non-medical home care we have the lifeline we have an array of services so especially when when adult children are concerned and they don't know where to turn we can kind of help them walk through that maze and really be that first call for them. And if it's not under our umbrella, we're so connected to the community, we're going to find somebody that can help them. Certainly, because care and compassion, of course, are part Absolutely. of the, the mayor's compassion at Louisville, yes. and you certainly fit that quite well. And networking resources, as I understand, in our community Absolutely. is extremely important. So thank you for all that you do and for senior care experts. To find out more, do log on to www.srcareexperts.org. This segment features Stage One Family Theater. Stage One Family Theater is the only professional theater for children and families in Louisville each season. They serve nearly 80,000 children from 30 area counties with theater programming that is both educational and inspirational. 
Stage one believes in every child and continues to find new ways to break down barriers to arts access for every child in our community. I'm here today with Stage One's director in development, Agil Reyes. Now, Agil, great to have you on Thank again. You, so much. you are for so being here. engulfed in the theater community <laughs> from being a director yeah. and now working with children. That's right. And so let's talk a little bit about the accessibility of the work that you do and how do you make it accessible to 80,000 children? Absolutely. Well, you know, in 2010, we actually started a program called Play It Forward, which is our ticket underwriting program. And it only exists out of the generosity of our sponsors in the community who um, believe in this to the degree that they're willing to put this in. And every year, we're able to fully underwrite tickets for several grades for our shows. And Play It Forward is such an interesting program because it is probably the most inclusive arts program in the region. You know, we said we, 30 counties, um, but that's Kentucky and Indiana. That's um, every parochial, private, Catholic, you know, um, home schools. Uh, we see so much JCPS, um, and and it makes for a diverse audience. It sure does. And, a diverse subject, yeah, certainly. Absolutely. So tell me why it's important from your perspective to have this accessible to so many and so many different types of students and uh, demographics. Yeah. Well, the arts are so important to a child's development, right? You know, we know that. Um, an arts-rich education helps children succeed in school and later in life. That empathy uh, is, is something that theater teaches. It's one of the only ways that you can really get that emotional education sometimes. Um, so, so we want to be sure that every child has the same opportunity to experience the arts regularly and richly um, so that they can reap those benefits. I also think it's interesting to, for the accessibility to let children know that this is something they can do. Oh yeah. So many times they see, they watch, but to know that it's really tangible yeah. and they too can participate in something like this in their lifetime. Nobody wakes up when they're 30 and goes to the opera for the first time, you know, <laughs> right? You have Sunday. to have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't say nobody, but you know, you have to have that experience and you have to be introduced to it. And when these kids come in and their eyes are as big as saucers, they're walking to the Kentucky Center for the Performing Arts, they're so it's excited. It's a big experience, yeah. certainly. Tell me, um, give me one description of a program because as we were talking before the show about, that's a wide age range, K through oh, eight sure. and different messaging. Can you give me an example yeah. of one uh, of uh, If I may, I'll give you an example of each. Okay. Um, we commissioned this wonderful play called and, and In This Corner, Cassius Clay, about young Muhammad. Ali growing up in Louisville, in segregated Louisville, and some of his decisions um, to become a voice in the civil rights movement. And that play, uh, I had a mother come up to me afterward and, and, and say, you know, she's a friend, but she said, you know, this is opening up a conversation between me and my daughter that we wouldn't have had otherwise, because they didn't have the common ground to sort of talk about it. You know, and then other plays like um, Lily's Purple Plastic Purse, um, which is a nice, you know, children's classic, you know, it's got themes of bullying and patience and, and and kids learn uh, because they're experiencing those stories. You know, if you think about storytelling, um, that is how we have passed down our values for many generations. And this is one of those ways that we really instill those values in our kids. Well, I think it's always great to be able to get a point across uh, mm -hmm. that could ordinarily probably be boring as an adult trying to tell a child. But then if you're educating them through entertaining them yeah. as well through play, I think that that is always so wonderful. Exactly. So what about schools? How do you get in touch with schools or how can schools get in touch with you to be involved? You know, we have really great partners in the school system here. Um, both superintendents, JCPS and Archdiocese are honorary board members, so we're really connected to them. But it's really our connection to the teachers that makes a big difference. We go in and do in-school residencies with them to help them teach um, what they want, what they need a little help with in the curriculum. Um, because like we said, yeah, every child learns differently. And this is one way that they can experience that. Do you have a lot of great partners within the community as businesses or other <laughs> philanthropic organizations? How much time do we have? Yeah, right? keep going, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the show's yours. You know, we, <laughs> we, we work with the arts magnet schools, for instance, to kind of enrich some of their programming. We do work with pre-educated youth um, to help keep them out of the system. We've got this wonderful program with the U of L Center for Autism where we do sensory friendly performances of each of our each of our shows. That's another way that we're looking at accessibility. You know, those kids and their families probably wouldn't feel comfortable coming to a show unless we say, no, this is for you. It's specifically for you so that I don't feel awkward going into yeah. a situation where there's others that aren't like that. Yeah, and we make accommodations there and you know, we have different lighting, we have more space in the theater, you know, so that we know they're comfortable 
and and they can experience it like everybody else. Well, tell me about the the company that, of actors that you keep for this. Um, it, are these volunteer based? You know, who writes the material? Sure. Actually, for stage one, everything is on the professional equity theater level. So um, there are some non-equity actors, but we keep a lot of equity contracts. So that's you know the professional actors that live in and around here. Sometimes from Chicago, sometimes from New York. We'll bring people in if we need to. Um, and the playwrights are also big national known playwrights. You know, Adrice Goodwin, who wrote. Uh, uh, Cassius Clay for us. Um, you know, he's had work at the Humana Festival at Actors and all over the country. So, is this the type of programming you're seeing across the country from community to community, or is this something we need to see more of? You know, it's it's a mix of the two. I think that a lot of the children's and family theaters across the nation are, are really starting to innovate with what they're doing. You know, we're doing a program later this year where we're going to integrate some technology um, into our story of Harold and the Purple Crayon, so kids can draw along. Um, and that, that's for a little bitty is the kindergarten and second grade type age age range, um, but you know things like Cassius Clay, those are those are some of the innovative things that um, really speak to a community. You know, especially because he's our home, one of our hometown right. heroes. You know, um, but also that goes on. You know, that's going to be in St. Louis at a theater there um, this year. Um, and, and of course with Ferguson they've had a lot of issues and they want to be able to open up that conversation and they're using theater to do it. What I imagine too in your younger age range is like you said um, in like K1 and 2 you're going to have to probably do oh, some interaction yeah. to keep them involved because their attention span is about 2.5 seconds. Oh so. absolutely yeah <laughs> we keep all the shows nice and short. We also have a little storytellers <laughs> program that is fully interactive. So yeah we, we find ways to reach all the kids where they are. Well, excellent. I've got some lighted tutus and things at home from uh, previous days. If you ever need to borrow any, Let's do you it. know, flashers, that would be just fine. Um, tell me a little bit about how you feel that this plays into the compassionate Louisville model. Well, you know, I think part part of it is is that accessibility um, component that we really work hard to make sure that no child um, uh, that cost is not a barrier to experiencing the arts. You know, and and looking at how the arts affect those kids and give them that emotional capacity growing forward. Um, they're going to become more engaged adults. They're going to be people who want to give back to our community. I think that's great. And thank you so much for what you're doing. So if people want to get involved, yeah. if they want to donate, or if they have groups or, or are a group that wants to get in touch with you, I assume that they can go on www.stage1. Dot org and talk mm -hmm. to your folks and I'm sure on your website there's a list of uh, wonderful resources. All kinds of things that we do, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being involved in the community the way you are. I don't know how you do all that you do. <laughs> it seems like you're writing and doing and directing for just about everything. So, Gil, thank you so much for being here today. Again, you. if you'd like to find out more, please log on to www.stage1.org or also contact us at www.compassionatelouisville.org. This segment features the Resilient Families Project at Wayside Christian Missions Hotel Louisville. The Resilient Families Project provides educational experiences to strengthen families and promote resilience, compassion, and wellness for children and families and parents experiencing homelessness. This project and its programs serve the residents of Wayside Christian Missions Hotel Louisville and Wayside Christian Missions Emergency Homeless Shelter. The Resilient Families Project was established in June of 2011 as a partnership of faculty and students such as Dr. Laura Haynes and Danielle Dill who are here with us today from the University of Louisville's Department of Psychology and Brain Sciences and staff at Wayside Christian Mission. Uh, Wayside Christian Mission's Hotel Louisville is also home to Compassionate Louisville's Coordinating Circle which has meetings there twice a month. And also joining us we have Nina Mo Mosley who's the COO of Wayside Christian Mission as well. Now, Dr. Haynes, we've got a full couch here today, <laughs> no doubt. So, Dr. Haynes, tell me a, um, a little bit about the goals of the Resilient Families Project. I know a lot of people see the um, Hotel Louisville down mm -hmm. there, and I know that they may say, what is that, and what is the Resilience Families Project? So, sure. educate us real quick. Sure. So, we have programs uh, where our values are stated each week every Thursday night when we meet we talk about the importance of family matters we believe in um, the power of healthy attachment relationships um, the notion that if we have positive caregivers in our lives who offer warmth um, and responsiveness at the same time that they offer safety and structure that you know that positive relationship could potentially solve all your problems 
So um, positiveness in your life in a structured environment. Yep. You're saying so is key. positive relationships, and typically that's caregivers and kiddos. But we also talk about we're all family, you know, and it can be between any two people, you know, sharing a healthy relationship where that positive support can help you get through any potential risk um, with some resilience. Yeah. Well, and Danielle, um, when do you offer these programs um, for the community? We hold our programs on Thursday evenings from about 6 to 8.30. Uh, we are together every Thursday throughout the year whenever UofL is in session. And of course, we take breaks for holidays um, and a few breaks during the summer as well. Uh, Nina, how many families participate in something like this? We require all of our families to attend this program because we recognize the value of it and the importance of it. So on any given night, there's about 100 parents and children involved in this program. Have you seen the success of that type of partnership and that type of um, continuing support and involvement? We have seen that with the Resilient Families Project. It is absolutely unbelievable the transformation for these parents when they go through that program. I, I personally attended the first graduation session mm -hmm. and we were all just in tears to see the parents who had learned so many new things with the children. Many of our parents have actually gotten their children back from state's custody through attending this program, participating in learning good parenting skills. And it's putting lives back together and families back together. Correct. Oh, that's Making excellent. Making strong families. Yes. Absolutely. Now, Danielle, um, obviously, as Nina had explained, 100, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a large group. How do you keep everyone engaged uh, in the conversation? Yes. Well, of course, it's difficult sometimes, <laughs> um, especially with some of our younger children who haven't quite learned the concepts of sitting down and paying attention. Um, we work very hard to ensure that all of our programs are uh, tailored very well to the families um, and are as interactive as possible. Um, so anytime that we are reading or gathered together, we try to get the kids involved um, to practice social skills as well as just letting them get out of their seats for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, all of our programs are designed with the kids in mind. Um, and occasionally we sometimes just ask, you know, what would you all want to do? What would best serve you? Um, we've done dance parties and uh, photo booths mm -hmm. and some things that are really making just fun. making it fun, certainly yeah. for the younger generations. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Haynes, who makes up your Resilient Families um, project team? Sure. We uh, have primarily students from U of L. Some of them are interns. Many of them are service learning students. Some come from our department. Some come from nursing and other departments across campus. Um, a large portion of our team members really is going to come from alumni, so folks who've been with us uh, for coursework um, and who've graduated and just never left because um, they've <laughs> fallen in love with the families <laughs> and with each other. Um, and we also have uh, community volunteers community partners, um, and well, that's what I was of course ask, staff right. from mm -hmm. Wayside Christian Mission who are our great, really our, our, our support team that never leaves our side because we, we know that we, we have their, their um, careful care in, in getting us through the night in terms of caseworkers and that sort of thing. On your community partners, um, do you seek out community partners? Do people regularly come to you um, to partner in this program? That's a good question. We've had an op open door policy thanks to the Mosleys and to the hotel atmosphere in general um, that people like um, Chaplain Michael Blanc will bring folks by anytime someone comes and says they're interested in volunteering, he'll just bring them in the door to kind of shadow and see what we're doing. And very often that's where people realize this is a fit, this is a place I could fall in love with my, you know, the folks I'm meeting, with my team, maybe even with myself a little bit, you know, learn more about kind of my purpose and my passion in the world as a citizen. Um, and so that's, that's one place where we end up with um, a, good, a good bit of connection. Uh, and then what happens is oftentimes these are folks who come with skills that are hidden gems. Um, one great example is Erin Fitzgerald who wrote a book called Smart Butt. And she came to us as a volunteer, was writing this book, um, tried out some of the vignettes and chapters and interactivities with our team. We actually worked together to earn a small grant through the Kentucky Foundation for Women. And one summer, her and another artist came and helped facilitate programs for that whole summer, which was really a windfall because we were very short-staffed in summer. 
Another one of our favorite um, partners is Paws with Purpose. So this is a, an organization where these are, these are dogs that are trained by women in the correctional facility, um, and those dogs are eventually placed with individuals who have various physical or emotional mm -hmm. or whatever needs. Um, and it's a really wonderful partnership because not only do they come to us and talk about what they do and how you know, it's important to have a purpose, we also work hard to figure out ways our, our residents, our clients, our family in the room can give back to them. So we do things like make dog treats, we make dog tugs for the dogs to work in homes where those tugs help them open refrigerator doors and, and turn on light switches and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. that's great. Now, mm -hmm. Nina, tell me about some, I know you have to have, I always have success stories and projects mm -hmm. that I do that's kind of, mm -hmm. you keep those for the rainy days, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any success stories you'd like to share with us? Well, without naming specific families, we have had families who have come through the Resilient Families Project and Wayside Christian Mission. Many of them are women who are in recovery program. Um, but just families in general as well who have gone through that program and, as I said before, received their children back from state's custody. And it is just unbelievable to see them do that, um, to, to see how just elated they are mm -hmm. when they put their families back together. And then to see that, yes, I can be a good mother and I can help my child. And so it's just very satisfying when you see all of that come together and folks are able to move out as a strong family in our community. Now let me ask, I'm not sure who wants to answer this, what about case management? Once um, a family graduates from the program, um, I'm, I'm sure your doors are always welcome, mm -hmm. you know, open mm -hmm. to them. Is there, are there case managers involved to follow that family? We do have a case worker that's with us every single program we have. His name's Mark Miller. He's one of my heroes. I'll never, <laughs> ever, ever uh, not say that um, in terms of his support um, and and as you say graduating it's very interesting because uh, honestly the first year we had a graduation ceremony is the last year we had a graduation <laughs> uh, ceremony because we sort of figured out the minute you say you're done people think they're done and you right. know as a parent we're never really done growing and learning it's from always our a kids journey and so on. that's right so um, so really it, it's very interesting that we have a lot of families and women in the recovery program who still attend even after they're not required well, to life is so. always changing it's always challenges mm -hmm. and we always have to learn and grow through those challenges so mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here today to teach us about the resilient families project and for more information on resilient families uh, you can log on to www.waysidechristianmission.org and you can always contact us at www.compassionatelouisville.org. I'm Heather French Henry and thank you for joining us for Heart of Gold.